my, my retinas are getting a workout. I went from bright sunlight to pitch black, and now I, now I can't see again. Oh, welcome, everybody, because uh, I can't see a single one of you. There you go. I can see some of you now. Welcome. Uh, this is the, uh, the last day of school, the last day of Mars Hill for this school year. Um, this, this day of school is always uh, an interesting one, as you can tell from the, the seniors always give us a little extra love on this day. Um, they're no longer, uh, they, they've already graduated, and so, um, in fact, maybe they haven't. Um, somebody with pink hair came into my office and asked me to sign their diploma. And uh, I'm still considering whether I'm going to do that or not. <laughs> no, this is a special day for us. Uh, in addition to the, just the, the amazing time we have at graduation and remembering our seniors and um, kind of looking back, uh, we get to celebrate the, the end of the first uh, school year for these seventh graders. And uh, every seventh grader does this Kentucky history play. You can go back and probably find all of this year's seniors in the play that they did. Uh, this is just an awesome thing for us that we do every year. Uh, and it's, it's part of our Kentucky history class, which is the seventh grade history class. Uh, and it's a, that's a very important class for us. It's one of the bookends of um, just tying everything together at Mars Hill, who we are. Um, and uh, I, teach the, I now teach the senior seminar class, which is the other, uh, the other bookend of that. So we get to see him here in seventh grade in Kentucky history and see them as seniors in the senior seminar class. And it's just really special. Every, day, every year this day, I, uh, I'm remembering where all the seniors came from. Uh, and then I'm looking forward to where these seventh graders are going to be in, uh, in five years. Five years? Six years? I think it's five years. Um, so welcome, parents, grandparents, friends, family friends. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Billy Henderson, who is our uh, headmaster emeritus. He teaches. He's still here teaching Kentucky history, and uh, we're glad that he's going to stay on with us as long as, as, long as he will. Um, so let's give him a hand and uh, get ready for the Kentucky history class. Oddly enough, I was going to step up and let's say, let's give Mr. Hughes a big hand. He, uh, this is his first year, and uh, it's, it's a new day for Mars Hill. Uh, it, it's been very powerful this year, and a lot of that is due to uh, Ben's prayer, his character, uh, his giftings. And just like in Kentucky, we see the uh, Kentucky seal where there's a guy in buckskins and a guy in a suit. It was the suit that took it further. I believe we're at that day here at Mars Hill. So Mr. Hughes, thank you for taking it on. Let's give him a hand. So Kentucky has always contributed to the literary world. We've had some pretty great writers. Uh, one of the early, uh, he, he may have been the first poet laureate uh, that there ever was, it was a guy named Jesse Penn Warren. How many of you all have ever uh, read something by Jesse Penn Warren. Could you raise your hand? Which really doesn't matter because I can't see at all. Uh, then uh, Thomas Merton, you may have heard of him. He, he is known internationally uh, for his writings, maybe less in Kentucky than he is around the world. Uh, we also have a couple of guys, James Lane Allen, you've driven on a street named after him, and a guy named John Fox. Uh, John Fox wrote the first novel that, uh, that ever sold a million, or the first English novel that ever sold a million copies. So kudos to John Fox. But we've made a unique contribution with the early female writers with a lady named Elizabeth Maddox Roberts. She was born right down here in Perival, and her, her most significant book that she wrote was called A Time of Man. Now speaking of John Fox, he wrote a book called um, the Little Shepherd of Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come is just a little spot on the map up in the mountains. But Chad is a young man who comes of age and learns what life is all about during the Civil War. Well, uh, Elizabeth's story, The Time of Man, is the very same thing, except it's a little girl. And so, believe it or not, we have asked Mrs. Maddox to come 
and lead us through Kentucky history this morning. And she agreed to come tell her story and then help us tell the whole story beginning all the way back with those early pioneers that we all know. So let's give them a hand and, uh, and then get ready to enjoy an hour of Kentucky history. God bless you. Elizabeth Maddox Roberts. I am an American author who was born on October 30th, 1881 in Perryville, Kentucky. Soon we moved to Springfield where I spent the majority of my life. Ever since I was a young lass, I have been devoted to my writing, often working at my desk in 24-hour shifts. Many hardships sprung up as I struggled to fulfill my dream of becoming an author. However, I was determined to gain the knowledge I sought. When times are hardest, I would stroll in the peaceful green of our commonwealth. Life was rough and tumble with eight siblings, but I enjoyed company. I remember their bored faces when we went to school in Covington, their heads lolling to the side or resting on the textbook. I went on to teach at Washington County School that had to stop from a racking cough. A few years later, I tried to attend the University of Kentucky, but again, my illness pulled me away from my study. I never gave up. At age 36, I was accepted into the University of Chicago. Four years later, I graduated with honors and received my bachelor's degree in literature. My first book, The Time of Man, was a success, being translated into six languages, Swedish, Norwegian, Dutch, German, French, and Spanish. I went on to write seven novels, three volumes of poetry, and two collections of short stories. I never got married, preferring my books to romance. <coughs> <coughs> my condition worsened. Over the course of two years, I had throat surgery and was treated for skin issues. Sadly, during the frigid Kentucky winters, I had to go to Florida to avoid making my condition worse. In 1936, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. As the sunny Orlando days passed, I would long to reunite with my land. My heart will always lie in Kentucky, no matter where I might be. <coughs> On March 13, 1931, I was sitting on the porch to my beach house, sunbathing. I had been to church that morning and was mulling over the pastor's sermon. My thoughts drifted and the world seemed to be slipping away as a poem I had written quivered in my mind. My heart is beating up and down, is walking like some heavy feet. My heart is going every day and I hear it jump and beat. A night before I go to sleep, I feel it jump in my head. I hear it beat in my neck and in the pillow on my bed. And then I make up little words to go along and say with it. The men are sailing home from Troy and all the lamps are shining. The men are sailing home from Troy and all the lamps are shining. Well, enough about me. Let's talk about Kentucky. The 15th state of our commonwealth started building forts in 1775 and 74. <coughs> what was life like then? What were these folks thinking about? Well, there's no known pioneer like Daniel Boone. Born in Pennsylvania and come to us by way of North Carolina, he led the establishment of one of the most early forts and served for to, for, to protect that early band of pioneers that opened this land. I think I hear him now.
Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Boone, and I'd like to tell you a little about myself. I was born November 2nd, 1734, to Squire and Sarah Boone in Pennsylvania. I got my first rifle when I was 12, and hunted for my family all the time. Hunting is my favorite thing to do. When I first set foot on Kentucky soil with John Finley and James Stewart, I saw my first buffalo. That first buffalo was a good sign that Kentucky was full of animals. Later that year, I returned home to Pennsylvania. Colonel Richard Henderson, a friend of mine, asked me to carve out a road for the new College of Kentucky. That road would later be called Wilderness Road. It took about three months to finish Wilderness Road. Afterwards, I decided to build Fort Boonesboro. And in 1775, I brought my wife, Rebecca Boone, and I had ten kids down there. We had many good times living in the fort, but there were some dangerous ones as well. Once, when I was out getting salt from the nearby Licking River, I was captured by Shawnee Chief Blackfish, and he forced me to run the dreaded Indian gauntlet. Afterwards, he made me his adopted son, and for four months, I pretended like an Indian. But when I heard about an Indian attack on Fort Boonesboro, I made my escape. I stole a horse and ran it till it died. Then I ran 160 miles on foot to Fort Boonesboro. I made it just in time to warn my family and friends. Then the battle had begun. We fought for days, and in the end, we won the battle. But with all the losses we took, I don't think it was a win. As I always say, in war, there are no winners, just survivors. Even though I had financial troubles my whole life, I lived a very happy life in the wilds of Kentucky. You know, there was another early Kentuckian who was just as strong as me. His name is Simon Kenton. As a matter of fact, he once saved my life. He's supposed to meet me by that tree over there, but I haven't seen him. Oh. <laughs> hey, Simon, what's the news? Well, I haven't seen the Shawnee in weeks. It's either they're gone or they're preparing. But you know, we always need to be ready. Well. Since you've explained some about your life, I'll explain some about mine. I was born on April 3rd, 1755. But my adventures didn't really begin until I was around 16. We came into Kentucky from opposite directions. You came down the Cumberland Gap looking for adventure, while I came down the river, and I was running from the law. When I was around 16, I fell in love with a girl named Ellen Cummins. But the fool I was back then, I got so tongue-tied around her. And that's when William Leachman beat me to her. I was infuriated with William. So on the day of his wedding to Ellen, I came for a fight but I got whipped by William Leachman. <laughs> he whipped me in front of his wedding crowd. Um, and so when I ran into him chopping wood one day, I could not resist another fight. My anger was growing, so I attacked William, and this time it went my way. He got caught up in a bush and I continued to throw out all my anger on him until he stopped moving. I had killed a man. I didn't know what to do. I ran from my father's farm using the name Simon Butler as cover for my crime. Eventually, I ended up in the land of Kentucky, which was a blessing and a curse. The lands were beautiful, and the hunting was amazing. But the Indians, prominently the Shawnee, were like an infestation on the land which I loved. In 1775, I moved to one of the forts that was being constructed in, Boone, um, in Kentucky. It was Fort Boone, or Boonesboro. That's where I served as a scout. On one particular attack on Boonesboro, I saved Daniel Boone here himself. He was shot and on the ground. And I was back in the fort, and I only knew one thing to do. An Indian was above him getting ready for the kill. And so, with the same force and adrenaline I had used against William Leachman, 
I ran out of the fort, shot the engine above Moon, then clubbed another near him. And then carried Boone back into the fort. Yes, that was a good day of fighting. I fought in many wars. The Revolution, the War of 1812, and a couple others. And every once in a while, the Indians would get a hold of me. And when they did, they made me run the torturous Indian gauntlet. The gauntlet was two long lines of Indians facing each other, armed with tomahawks. They would make me run between them as they hit me over and over again. It was a painful experience, and I ran it nine different times. And on one of them, I got hit in the head with a tomahawk, and I carried that hole in my head for the rest of my life. Of, during my adventures, I did return to my father's farm, and there to greet me was William Leachman. William Leachman was alive. He forgave me for our fight. William Leachman forgave me, just as Christ did in 1808. After 1812, in 1820, I moved to um, Ohio. And there I lived in poverty due to poor money choices. Oh. And um, there in that state, neighboring the land where my adventures had all taken place, in 1836, I laid down to rest and never saw the light of day again. probably the two best known pioneers in Kentucky history. However, there is another amazing character that I just had to have come here and tell his story. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you Elijah Cray. Well, hello all of you. I am Elijah Craig one of Kentucky's most notable Baptist preachers, the founder of her first classical school, and the inventor of bourbon whiskey. But exactly how did all this happen? Well, it began in 1738, when I was born fourth in a family of 10 children in Orange County, Virginia. And I would not be the only one known for preaching. Though I remember little of my early life, one of the most notable events in it, or most likely the most, was my conversion to Christianity in 1768. Thrilled by the love of Jesus, I began holding my own sermons in my tobacco barn, hoping to share this wonderful gospel. However, this part of my life was not free of trial. And because this was when America was still made up of colonies and the British ruled. So me and my brother Lewis were jailed several times for preaching contrary to them. However, this was only in the East. We had heard of a place west of us where we could practice this religion as much as we wanted. So, in 1771, Lewis brought a party of 600 people to Kentucky, or the land that would soon become it. However, I only left a year later with my own party. We settled in an area that we would call Lebanon, but we changed its name later to honor George Washington. This city was where the rest of my life would take place. Well, little happened in it for a few years. However, in 1887, er, I'm sorry, 1787, I founded our first classical school, and there was overwhelming praise. It was wonderful. I had many effects on the earliest education of Kentucky. I, because I also donated land to Georgetown College. This was a Christian college that would continue for hundreds of years. But this was not my only effect on my new hometown. I was relatively poor in 1789 and had 10 children. So I did the obvious thing. 
I started a distil distillery to sell my whiskey. <laughs> However, I did not have much support, and if I did not find a breakthrough discovery, the distillery could close. However, one thing didn't exactly help it. A fire destroyed half my distillery and the staves in it, as well as the whiskey, or it was charred at least. So I was furious. I had no option but to sip the staves down the Mississippi as they were far too expensive to throw out. So on the boat to Baton Rouge, I was worried while they were on. However, when they reached Louisiana, I received overwhelming praise because the char on the caskets and <laughs> the staves had affected the whiskey in an amazing way. However, the praise I got confused me. I had no idea how the char had, could have made it better. Mm -hmm. But I attempted to try it myself, and sure enough, it worked. This was the invention my distillery needed, and it continues to the present. Mm -hmm. But through all this time, I never left my Lord Jesus. From the day I heard of the gospel, I preached for 40 years until I took my final breath in 1808. seen the great seal of Kentucky. A man in buckskins and a man in a suit are shaking hands. That signified the appreciation of the arriving politicians and educated class of for the old pioneer and vice versa. They knew they had to be united. One of our earliest political leaders actually went on to be the vice president of the United States. However, he was first a military man. I don't want to give the story away. So now I present to you Vice President Johnson. Hello, my name is Richard Mentor Johnson. I served in the Kentucky State Legislature, the House of Representatives and Senate, and I was the ninth Vice President of the United States of America. My life story and political career included many trials that I overcame and elections that I won. And although I now have four counties named after me and many people who know my name, I wasn't always famous. I was born in 1780 on my family's farm where I attended a local grammar school until I was 16 years old. After I turned 16, I went to Transylvania University where I studied law. I passed the bar in 1802 and was elected to the Kentucky State Legislature the following year. In 1807, I was elected to the House of Representatives, and I stayed there until 1812, when the War of 1812 broke out. I left my seat in the House to serve my country, and I was colonel of a regiment that fight in the Battle of Thames. As I rode into the battle, I could feel my horse galloping beneath me, and as I spotted the great Indian chief Tecumseh, I drew my pistol and shot him dead. I watched as Tecumseh slid off the man he had pinned down as all the Indians fled the scene, marking the end to the Northwestern Indian Wars that started 20 years prior. Some of my political opponents said I was not the man who had slain Tecumseh, but I knew I'd killed him. I was wounded in the War of 1812 and had to return to Washington, but that allowed me to go back to being the House of Representatives. I stayed there until 1819, until I was appointed to the Senate after a man named John Crittenden left his seat. I stayed in the Senate until 1829, where I was then re-elected back to the House of Representatives, and I stayed there until 1837. During my time in the House, I was hoping to become Vice President of the United States of America, and in 1832, I sought to achieve that goal. Sadly, Martin Van Buren was chosen over me, but I could try again in 1836, when Van Buren was running for president. There are four candidates for the vice presidency, one of which was me, but for the first time in American history, the Electoral College could not decide on the nominee. That meant it was up to Congress to choose who should be nominated for vice presidency, and they chose me. 
Van Buren and I would go on to win the election, but my position as vice president was one of obscurity. I cast 13 tie-breaking votes, but besides that, I wasn't discussed much for policy matters. This was infuriating, as I was a great candidate for vice presidency, and Van Buren treated me like a cordial friend and said the important politician I was. There were even rumors Van Buren would have preferred former Senator William C. Rives of Virginia over me. <laughs> <laughs> After I finished my term in the vice presidency, I returned to the Kentucky State Legislature from 1841 to 1843. I was re-elected to the state legislature in 1850, but before I could take my seat, I suffered from a stroke and died. Well, another important figure is the evolving political scene was some called our favorite son, Henry Clay. If you drive down Main Street, Lexington, towards Lee's Down Pike, you will see the effigy of a man perched high above the Kentucky C Lexington C Cemetery. This is befitting of a man who towered during his life in both our state and nation. Henry, will you join us? Hello. My sorry, Henry could not be here today. So I was always covering for him in Lexington. So I guess I'll do the same today. My name is Lucretia Hart Clay, wife of the famous Henry Clay. I was born on March 18, 1781 in Hagerstown, Maryland. We lived there until in, eight, in 1787, we moved to Kentucky. My father, Colonel Thomas Hart, was a landowner, merchant, manufacturer, and he was the leader of the frontier community. I helped him raise hemp, and we made rope from that and sold it to the U.S. Navy. In addition, I helped him manage his large and very successful estate and farm. I was also very skilled in weaving, cooking, and spinning, which all helped me later in my family life. You all are probably wondering, how did I meet Henry? Well, I met him when he was a rising young attorney. He used to visit my father. And he did seem as if he had some pro a promising future. So, as it, he was engaged in many professional and social events, and he didn't look too shabby either. <laughs> <laughs> and after courting for a little while, we were married on April 11, 1799. It was the happiest day of my life. And our wedding was rather extravagant. After Henry dragged me around the frontier, we finally settled in Ashland. I love my home there, and that is where we, I mean, I'm mostly, because Henry was away a lot in Washington, D.C., raised all 11 of my beautiful ch children. As if it was not already hard enough to care and feed them every single day, I could not hardly educate them all properly. So. I hired a private tutor named Amos Kendall, and he willingly educated them all. Even though me and Henry count ourselves fortunate, in 1835, all six of my daughters died from yellow fever and whooping cough, and my son, Henry Jr., died at the Battle of Buena Vista during the Mexican-American War. As if I was not already struggling from devastation, my husband, died from tuberculosis in 1852 at the age of 75. I was heartbroken and I could not possibly manage Ashland because it was in such bad condition. So my dear son James, he took it over. He tore it down and rebuilt it as a memorial to his father while I stayed in my son John's house. And that is where I breathed my last breath. By then, I had, mar I had buried all of my children except four. Well, we all know that Henry wanted to see slavery abolished, but he somehow found a road through difficult challenges that moved us slowly toward gradually emancipating slaves. Unfortunately, 
Henry died and Rashomon took the reins. Kentucky was all, has always been a unique culture. There could not be better illustrated than realizing that during the Civil War, two Kentuckians served as president of their respective countries. Jefferson Davis was the only president of the Confederate States of America, while Abraham Lincoln led the rest of the world. It was a war that should have never happened. Surely, if Britain and the rest of the world can mature enough to recognize the humanity of those enslaved and set them free out uh, without so much bloodshed, we should have been able to do the same. However, I cannot blame either president. It didn't seem almost inevitable. Events after the war weighed heavy on Jeff Def Davis, so much so that he is unable to be with us today. But his energetic wife said she would love to tell the Davis story. Greetings, my name is Verena Hal Davis, wife of the one and only Confederate President Jefferson Davis. I was born on May 26, 1826 in Louisiana, but my family settled in Natchez, Mississippi, my mother's hometown. Although my father later went bankrupt, I had a good education in Philadelphia at a boarding school. When I returned home, I had few chances of being married, as father had no money to pay my dowry, and I was more educated than most women of my time, which was looked down upon. Also, many people thought I was ugly because of my striking looks. However, things started looking up for me at the end of 1843. I met Jefferson Davis at a Christmas party that we both attended. He was very handsome and well-mannered. He had also grown up in Mississippi, but was born in Kentucky. Jeff had been a war hero, though he never spoke of it. He married Sarah Knox Taylor in June of 1835, but she died just three months after they married, and Jeff was devastated. He retreated to the wilderness where he created a plantation. He lived in seclusion for almost seven years and spent most of his time studying constitutional law and world literature. Eventually, he worked through his grief enough to realize he didn't want to stay unmarried for the rest of his days, so he married me in 1845. After our marriage, Jeff became a congressman, then a senator, and also the Secretary of War. He was extremely devoted to the land he loved. Between 1852 and 1864, we had six children. Samuel Emery, Margaret Howe, Jefferson Jr., Joseph Evan, William Howe, and Breen Ann. Samuel died of the measles before he was two, and then Joseph fell off the balcony when he was five. William died of diphtheria when he was 10, and then Jeff Jr. died of yellow fever when he was 21. Many mothers lost children in those days, and almost one in three didn't make it to adulthood. Common as it was, however, it didn't make it any easier on me. In 1861, Jeff was elected president of the Confederacy. I knew the South had no resources to win the war, as did Jeff, but I stood by him. He was frequently accused of treason for what he believed. After the war ended in the spring of 1865, Jeff and I had to flee Richmond from the Union forces. Finally, he was captured in Georgia. He served two years in prison at Fort Monroe in Virginia, but never stood trial. Jeff tried various businesses after he was released, but all of them fell through. On December 6, 1889, he died of pneumonia. I had always preferred urban to rural life, so I moved to New York City with Verena Ann. During the war, there were always a lot of military men coming to our house, and they were usually handsome enough. But there was one that all the ladies always swooned over, John Hunt Morgan. We have here the lady that caught him, before the Yankees did, of course. <laughs> Hello, my name is Maddie Reddy Morgan, and today I will be showing you my life. But before I do so, I want you to know who shaped my life. His name was John Hunt Morgan. He was born in Huntsville, Alabama in 1825, um, and he got an education in Kentucky. He would move on and join the army, and in, he would move on and join the army, and he would be he would fight in the Mexican War, and he would marry Rebecca Gratz Morgan. Sadly, she died not too long after. I was only 21 when the Civil War started in 1861, where I'd meet the love of my life, John Hunt Morgan. He was a quiet and a gentleman, and I loved him very much. 
And with my father's consent, I married him a few months later. After he went back to the Confederates, he moved to Kentucky where he fought with the Confederates. His daring and quick raids earned him a new nickname, the Thunderbolt of the Confederacy. He would ride into the battle with his men stealing horses, people, trains, supplies, and anything of value. Sadly, in September of 1864, he died while being shot in the back while staying in a home. I was devastated when I heard this news, and I went and moved in with my in-laws, and seven months later, Johnny was born. She was a blessing from God and the only thing that made me happy during this time. In 1865, the Civil War ended, and I married a new man, William Henry Williamson. Things went, to go, went fast, and I had five kids with him, one of which died not too long after she was born. Johnny remained a good sister and daughter to the whole family. And although I did not accept it, she started dating that union supporter, Reverend Joseph W. Caldwell. I did not accept this at all. I was a loyal Confederate to the very end. I died of tuberculosis in 1887 at 47 years old. After my death and against my wishes, Johnny married the union supporter and shortly after their honeymoon, she died of typhoid fever, leaving no descendants of my late husband, John Hunt Morgan. Now there is a Kentucky born president of the Union who led us through these dark times. He and his Lexington born wife are here today. Let us join them in their living room. Hello. My name is Abraham Lincoln. I was born on February 12, 1809, and yes, I was born in a log cabin. My mother, Thomas Lincoln, and, my, and I mean, my father, Thomas Lincoln, and my mother, Nancy Hanks, both came over from Virginia. In 1811, my family moved to Knob Creek Farm. Then, my mother was poisoned by mad milk. My father eventually remarried, though. My new mother was extremely nice and sweet, if I do say so myself. We became very good friends. When I was 16, I moved to a town in Illinois called New Salem. I entered the law business and started getting interested in politics. Then, I moved to Springfield, Illinois, where I started to take part in national cases. While, while I was there, the Black Hawk War started. I joined the militia. One time, an Indian came to our camp with a truce flag. There was a lot of distrust toward the Indians at that time, but I don't know why on earth they would want to lynch a guy like that. So I fought them off. There was a real big guy who came at me like a, came at me like a rhinoceros. And I hit him over the head with a chair. <laughs> Anybody else? I hollowed over his unconscious, unconscious body. They real scared me after that. <laughs> In Springfield, Illinois, at a party, I met my wonderful wife, Mary Todd Lincoln. Hello, folks. My name is Mary Todd Lincoln. I was born on December 13th, 1880. Through my birth in practically a mansion, I was connected to many political leaders. The Todd family was an important name in Springfield. Um, through my childhood, I went to many expensive schools, learned French, poetry, and Shakespeare, and how to have proper etiquette in my rich lifestyle. Before I married Abraham, I was the belle of the town. 
going to almost every party and being liked by almost every man in town. I met Abraham at yet another dance, and we were complete opposites in every way imaginable, in our height, gracefulness, and our use of words. Throughout our differences, we grew to love each other and were married, and were married soon after. My life directly after my marriage was a stark contrast to my life before, with only two small rooms in the boarding house with which we stayed at. Robert Lincoln's birth was a blessing even as money became tighter, and my, and my, father, my father's visit to his namesake birth and my father's visit to his namesake's birth was a blessing as he gave us one hundred and ninety five dollars <sighs> enough to, enough to enable us to buy our very first house I was especially pleased that we could have a parlor with which I could entertain in something that I couldn't do in a boarding house Several years later, no, several months later, my second son, Eddie, was born. He was a blessing, though money was a problem. Um, Abraham eventually um, through some political challenges, was um, able to be, um, have a seat in the Senate, um, which meant that we had to move to Washington. I did not like this at all, as we had to live again in a boarding house. <sighs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Because of my dislike for the boarding house, I moved back to Kentucky, where I was warmly welcomed by my Todd relations. And because of letters between me and Abraham, I went back to Washington, where his political journey was flourishing. Personal loss overshadowed Abraham's flourishing career as my father collapsed several months later the worst was when Eddie, our second child, died at age four. This devastated me, but I would have to move on. As when I was elected to into the White House, I was elected. But as soon as I was elected, all the southern states seceded. They formed the Confederate States of America. As the war dragged on, I had to draft. I had to write and draft the Gettysburg Address and the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation freed all the slaves on January 1st, 1865. When it was published, the Confederates tried a series of major attacks. Luckily, my smart new general, Ulysses S. Grant, was able to tactfully outlast them and counterattack when they were exhausted. I was elated when the war ended, but I wasn't able to relax. I decided 
me and my wife decided to go to Ford's Theater. We had just sat down when I heard a noise and I saw my bodyguard fall with a stab wound. I heard a sharp crack and everything went dark. Abraham was dead. Dead. I couldn't believe it. I only had two sons. And Abraham was dead. Willie had died while I was in the White House. Well, me and Abraham were living in the White House. I was devastated when Abraham died. He was what you would call my life's work. I clung on to him. Um, I clung on to his life for my life. And when he died, I wasn't sure I could keep going. But I guess I could. I guess I would have to. After Abraham died, I experienced more misery and pain than a person should have to deal with. Me and Tad, because of our money shortages, traveled to Europe, but we had to travel back to America because of, um, because of Tad's health declining. A few months later, Tad died. He was my lifeline after Abraham died. So his death brought me more misery and pain than anything. I felt almost crazy. I couldn't live life without my child and my husband. My older son must have thought I was crazy too, for he unjustly put me in an asylum. Robert Lincoln. How dare you do that to your mother? <laughs> After I was released because of the hard work of several of my closest friends, I feared Robert would put me in an asylum again. So I traveled to Europe where I could live inexpensively and comfortably. Though I had to travel back to America because of a fall and other health concerns. A few weeks later, where I, because I was staying in my sister Elizabeth's house, I went into a coma the day before I died. That day after, I died. My funeral, I probably would have been pleased with it. Almost 300 people came, and I was buried next to my husband. My life after that, almost seemed as if Abraham grew more famous than I was, and I grew less. But I would have to deal with that. I was dead. There was nothing I could do about it. <laughs> Well, that about does it for old Kentucky. However, some time after I passed from the scene, many famous Kentuckians rose to national and even international level. One of those is a man that I believe you call, what is his name? Sting like a bee. I'm not talking about that first bite. 
I'm talking about the second fight, 1965. One round, knockout. They called it a phantom punch. Nobody ever saw it, but it was very real to me. It's around this time that I became Muslim, devoted my life to the teachings of the great prophet Muhammad. And that's when my name became the thing, Muhammad Ali. It's also around this time that I married my first wife, Sanji Roy. <laughs> I was at the peak of my career. I divorced my first wife, married my second wife, Melinda Boyd. I was all set for the future. But then I was called to fight in the Vietnam War. I refused due to my religion. I was fined ten thousand dollars, five year ban or five years in prison, and three year ban from boxing. Luckily my appeal got me out of prison, but I was still banned and fined. In that band, it got sloppy and slow. This caused me to lose my first ever professional fight against Joe Frazier and title of heavyweight champion. Now oh, I better skip ahead a bit. We're going to be here all day talking about me, fights, me and my fights, and probably more about me. <laughs> <laughs> I lost four more times in my professional career, making my record when I retired 56 wins, five losses. But you shouldn't dwell on my losses. I won 56 bouts. 37 of them were knockouts. Six years later, I divorced my second wife and married my third wife, Ron and fourth. Nine years later, I got bored of her and married my fourth wife, Yolanda Williams, aka Lonnie Ali. She was with me until my passing on June 3, 2014, due to respiratory disease. But what I hope to take away from this talk that even though people have said that I am the greatest, in truth, I'm double the greatest. <laughs> I don't know what I had chosen to do with my life, believe I would have been the best at it. would be elated to hear about his namesake and the opportunity that was provided. Now, but now, I must close our chapter of Kentucky history. We carried the nation west and sent her further west. But our finest days are yet to come. We all from history have loved and cared for her. Now we leave you and her, her, you, her in you, your care. Thank you. 